Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible apps and uh, turn to the book of Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4 is our text today. Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Uh, Turn to page 921 and you will find Jonah chapter 4. And if uh, you're here and you need a Bible, uh, you want to read God's Word, but you don't have a Bible of your own, please take one of these. We want you to have the Word of God because we know if you read the Word of God, God will change your life. Uh, so we're wrapping up the, the series on Jonah. This is our, our last week because we ran out of chapters. But, uh, well, the story's coming to a conclusion. But I'm, I'm going to ask you this. How many of you knew the, the story of Jonah before we, we started this series? How many of you knew this? We're familiar with it. Okay, a lot of hands went up. A lot of them didn't go up. But uh, today we're concluding the story, and uh, the ending is just as surprising as the rest of the story. So think about it. The whole story is one surprise after the other. It begins with a surprise in chapter 1, when God says to Jonah, go to Nineveh, you know, your city of your enemies, and, and warn them of destruction that uh, I'm bringing to them, judgment that I'm bringing to them. And, and so then Jonah surprises, because if God tells you directly to do something, most of us are like, okay, I'm going to do it. But no, you know, Jonah goes the opposite direction, and that's a surprise. And then there's a surprise storm, because you out, can't outrun God, right? Right? And, and then there's that whole, you know, boat thing and throw him overboard. So they throw him overboard and then, surprise, he gets swallowed by a gigantic sea creature. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of surprises in chapter one. Chapter two, surprise, he repents. <laughs> it's what we all do when we're really, you know, at the, the depths of despair, right? But he re- repents and then there's a surprise deliverance because the fish vomits him out on the beach. <laughs> Congratulations, you're saved. And then, uh, and then he goes to Nineveh and he you know, proclaims what God told him to proclaim, and surprise, the entire city repents. I mean, this is a, you know, a a repentance of epic proportions, and and it surprises everyone. I'm not sure it surprised Jonah. And then we get to chapter 4. So God has just uh, relented of his disaster. The judgment has been postponed because of this miracle repentance of the entire city of Ninevites, and chapter 4 picks up. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Those are not words of praise at that moment. Those are words of accusation. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Right? You do feel the toddler coming out in him right there, right? Because that's, that's what we're seeing. And, and the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? And Jonah went out from the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he could see what would become of the city, still hoping for its destruction. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant, so it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint, and he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. I should probably read that. It's better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Didn't know, I realized Jonah was a junior high girl. And, <laughs> and then, wait a minute, it's not done. And the Lord said, to, I had junior high girls, I can say that. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh? That great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and all so much cattle. And then the story stops. That's it. 
That's where it leaves us. And, and, and this is such a weird and surprise ending to a weird and surprising story that, <clears throat> that really, I don't know about you, but here's this great miracle that just happened, and, and Jonah's mad about it. And, and so it's a disconnect of epic proportions. And here's the, the basic problem of the story, and chapter 4 reveals it. The problem is this, Jonah grieved when God rejoiced. Jonah grieved when God rejoiced. I mean, Jonah was all upset and God was celebrating. See, Jonah is used by God to produce an incredible miracle and he gets angry about it. He gets angry, he's displeased, he's upset. I mean, you think about it. Jonah did something that would have made Billy Graham envious. And yet he's not happy. And, and there's this huge disconnect, which begs the question, why? And we need to understand Jonah so that we don't become like Jonah. Because he is not a healthy biblical example for us to follow. I mean, Jonah is that guy. Do you really want to be that guy? Do you really want to be like him? I don't think so. So here's, here's the, the understanding. So let's understand Jonah. First of all, Jonah didn't uh, uh, celebrate with God because Jonah didn't get what he wanted. That's the, that's the first problem. Jonah didn't get what he wanted. What did Jonah want? Well, the first thing that Jonah wanted was the destruction of Nineveh. I mean, these were his enemies. They had already conquered and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, and they had subjugated the, the southern kingdom of Judah. And, and so, you know, they ruled over the Israelites and had hurt the Israelites. And Jonah was a, a Jew, and he didn't like the Assyrians. They were his enemies, and he wanted to see the destruction. And so when God said, hey, I'm going to destroy Nineveh, you go warn him about it. He's like, good, I want to see him destroyed. I don't want to go warn him. And, and so he wanted the mass judgment of 120,000 people. How callous, right? How ungodly. What a jerk. I mean, we would never want to see the destruction of our enemies. Would we? Uh-oh. So, you know, after terrorist attacks, we don't want to see the destruction of our enemies, do we? Or, you know, we don't want to really see the, the, the fall of our enemies when, you know, our political opponents win. Should I even mention ex-spouses? So what God does. Uh, you see, Jonah wanted the destruction of his enemies. And he's angry because God is gracious. You think about that. He's angry because God is merciful and slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And so he grieved when God rejoiced. Because he didn't get what he wanted. And he wanted the destruction of Nineveh. And Secondly, he grieved because he didn't get what he wanted because Jonah wanted his own comfort. Right? I mean, there's this whole plant thing. And let's just go ahead and acknowledge that is like one of the weirdest little sub-stories in Scripture you will ever read, right? Jonah's out there pouting on the edge of the city. He sits down because he wants to see if God will still destroy Nineveh because he's still rooting for that. And God says, ah, it's hot. Oh, let's give Jonah a plant. Now, God is obviously teaching Jonah a lesson in this because that's what God is always doing with us. He's always trying to grow us up. He's always trying to teach us. And so God gives him a plant. And Jonah's like, oh, shade, this is so nice. I love this plant. And then God, who also created worms, sent a worm. Worm ate the plant. Plant died. Jonah's mad, mad enough to die. I should just die out here because you took my plant away. Look, it's, it's ridiculous, but it's real. See, Jonah was selfish. Surprise! A servant of God can be selfish? Well, I know I can. Pretty sure you can too. In fact, I think selfishness is probably our, our root sin above everything else. And God tried to use Jonah's selfishness to demonstrate his own compassion. You care about the plants? Can't I care about 120,000 people? And here's the thing, we don't know if Jonah got it because the story just stops. There's no more about Jonah in, in scriptures, that's it, that's all we get. But the question isn't whether Jonah got it, the question is, do you get it? Do you get it? That 
God is more concerned with his mission than your comfort. Let me say that again. God is more concerned with his mission than he is with your comfort. And, and God is more focused on redeeming the lives of people than fulfilling your dreams or your desires or your preferences. In other words, when you get angry at God because he doesn't give you what you want or answer your requests in the way that you want him to be answered, you are in the company of a great biblical complainer. I mean, Jonah, it looks like, had the spiritual gift of whining. Uh, and, and, you're, and if you're you know, angry at God because you don't get what you want, then you're following the wrong example. Because the truth is you will never experience the joy of God by being selfish. Exclamation point. We need to get that. We're never going to be celebrating with God uh, if, if we're focused on just what we want. And, and see, here's the lie that Satan sells us. Oh, get what you want and you'll be happy. If you get what you want, what you desire, what you dream of, what your objective is, then you're going to be happy. And that is such a lie because all around this room, if we took the time to tell the stories, a lot of us in here got what we wanted and, and it didn't satisfy. And so we just wanted more. And that didn't satisfy. Because that's not where joy comes from. And Jonah missed that. See, Jonah, uh, you know, can I just point this out? You're never going to be happy in the midst of complaining. And, and what happens is we, we want something and we don't get it and we start complaining about it. And, and we think if I got it, I'll be happy. But we're not going to be happy because we're just sitting there complaining and whining about it. And that's what Jonah shows us in this text. And, and that reveals the next part of the pro problem, why Jonah was grieving while God was celebrating. And that's because Jonah didn't share God's heart. Jonah did not share the heart of God. Now get this, Jonah was part of the people of God because he was an Israelite. He was under the promise, the old covenant. And, and Jonah was a, well, he knew God. I mean, he had a relationship with God. We know this because he's having a conversation with God that is extremely personal and is far more specific than any conversation I've ever had with God. Probably than you've ever had with God. I mean, God told Jonah, hey, I want you to get up and go to this place, this time, now, do it. And Jonah said no. And then he and God continued to have that conversation. You know, all throughout this, they're having this ongoing conversation that reveals a relationship. So he's one of God's people. He has a relationship with God. He's God's servant. Reluctant, but obedient. But Jonah did not have the heart of God. You see, God's heart is for people. God's heart is for people. And, and, I, and I want you to, uh, to just consider this. If you read the Bible at all, it screams that God's heart is for people. I'm just going to give you a smattering. Let's, let's start with Jesus. Jesus said, Luke 19, 10, The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Probably the clearest mission statement that Jesus ever revealed. Son of Man came to seek and to save people that are lost. People who are far from God. People who need to know hope and life through the Son. Jesus told three parables in Luke 15. Uh, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And, and at the end of those parables, he basically said, Hey, this is what heaven does when one sinner repents. They throw a party. You want heaven to rejoice? You want heaven to celebrate? Then lead one sinner to repentance. Find one lost child of God and bring them home. That's the celebration, is when one person meets God. The great commandment. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Or how about Jesus in John 13 where he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Not if you go to church, look the right way, carry your Bible, check the boxes of religiosity. No, but if you love one another, then they'll know that you're my disciples. How about the apostles? 
The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy said, Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Notice he didn't come to save governments, nations. He didn't come, come to save the, some abstract. He came to save people who are sinners. God's heart is for people. The Apostle John I mean, I'm just going to say this. John goes absolutely crazy about this message in his first letter. So let me just read some of it. 1 John 3, For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. How about 1 John chapter 4? Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's heart is for people. Jonah didn't share God's heart because Jonah didn't care about the people of Nineveh. He actually wanted to see their destruction. And and so he did not share the heart of God, even as a servant of God, as part of the people of God. And this is why Jonah grieved when God was rejoicing. So allow me to ask, does your life reflect the heart of God? Does your life reflect the heart of God? Uh, Or are you living in the anger and sorrow and selfishness of Jonah? Which way are you leaning? Toward the heart of God or or toward the anger, sorrow, and selfishness of Jonah? Because, you know, you're going to lean one way or the other. And and this question matters especially if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Because if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you've already said, hey, I— I belong to God, and I'm going to have the heart of God, and I'm going to have the mind of Christ, and I'm going to serve him. So does your life reflect the heart of God? And, and, you know, it's really easy for us to to gloss over this, but I don't want us to, because it's really easy to say, well, we're here in church on Sunday morning, and we've been singing songs of praise, and and we've confessed Jesus, and, and all of this stuff. Doesn't that mean we have the heart of God? No, it doesn't. Look, Jonah didn't have the heart of God. Remember, he was one of the people of God. He knew God. He had a relationship with God. He was serving God, and he didn't share the heart of God. Therefore, he did what God asked him to do, but he wasn't happy about it. He was living in that sorrow and that anger and and that grief. And I've grown up in churches all across this country where people who I knew they had, uh, you know, a a relationship with Jesus. They were one of the people of God. They showed up in church every week. They checked all the boxes of being good people, but they did not have the heart of God. And they wondered where the joy was. And since they didn't have it, they usually made rules to make sure nobody else did either. Let's be honest about this, right? Because if you're not happy, do you really get excited when other people are happy? If you don't have joy, do you really like being around people who are joyful? So does your life reflect the heart of God? Does it reflect the heart of God at home? At home. Do you see that loving your spouse is part of your divine mission? Uh, And we need to get this because, um, again, a lot of you grew up in church like I did where you were there and and they always wanted you to do more. Hey, we need you to serve at this. We need you to help with that. We need you to do these things. And even though we talked about you got to take care of your family, we pull people away from their families and get them so busy they don't have time to take care of their families. That's not healthy. You see, the very first responsibility that God gave us is to take care of our families, That's kind of the the proving ground for ministry and and for being able to lead in the church is that you've got a healthy family. And and we kind of gloss over that a lot of times in church. We kind of pretend like that's not important. It's important to God. 
And the very first responsibility we have is in the home. And so do you understand that if you're married, that loving your spouse is your first divine calling? To put his or her needs before your preferences is to have the heart of God. And, and the truth is, our selfishness is most evident in our families. Right? Because we get home and it's been a long day, busy day. And I know most of you in this room are retired, but you still have long, busy days, don't you? Everybody goes, I don't know how I had time to work. And, and you get home and you're tired and, and, you know, I mean, it's late. It's like two in the afternoon and, and you want to put your feet up. Sorry, took a shot. And uh, you want to put your feet up and you don't, want, you don't want to eat something, but you don't want to fix it. You want someone else to fix it and you just want to relax and have some me time. And, you, and, and you, if we put our preferences onto our spouses and make demands, we're poisoning the relationship. Because God's called us to serve one another, to put their needs ahead of our needs so that, that we understand that we are to reflect the heart of God at home. So serve your spouse, care for your partner, and, and in doing that, you bless yourself and you share the heart of God. And let's not leave out the kids. If you got kids at home, uh, honestly, do you just want them to, and I guess we could include grandkids at this as well, do you just want them to shut up, be quiet, and leave you alone so you can have some personal time? How many times do we get home and we're like, can't these kids be quiet? Do you just want to relegate parenting to technology and TV and Alexa? Or are you going to love your children by investing time into the relationship, delighting in them, blessing them, building a healthy relationship that will last and you have influence? You see, the first calling is to minister at home and, and does you, your life reflect the heart of God at home. Okay, if you're not sure, and because it's really easy to go, well, yes, it does, and just go on living. But here's two challenges for you to figure out how you're doing at home. First of all, you and God have a conversation over 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. You know, it's a definition of love. It's the heart of that passage. Uh, it starts off this way. Love is patient. Love is kind. Some of you will never get past that. You're like, already failed. Shut the book. No, seriously, have that conversation with God. Read through that list of uh, defining what love looks like and then go, hey, am I doing this? And if not, God, help me to do this. It's a conversation you have with him where you invite him into your life to say, change me at this point. I want to be more patient. I want to be more kind. I, I, you know, I don't want to demand my own way. I want to keep no record of wrongs. All of those, those elements of what love looks like. So you and God have the conversation and let him speak into your life telling you whether or not you're reflecting his heart in your family. And then if you're still not sure, I dare you, ask your family. Ask your family, hey, does my heart reflect God's heart here in the home? And, and by the way, if they're afraid to answer you, you fail the test. <laughs> Just saying. You see, we want to reflect the heart of God. It begins at our home. So does your life reflect the heart of God at home? And does your life reflect the heart of God at church? At church, uh, you come to church, you see your friends, you love seeing your friends. Do you see anybody else when you come? Do you see the, the people who are, who are guests? You know, like, oh, I don't know them. Do, do you see them? Do you interact with them? Do you see the people who are lonely, who are broken, who are hurting? Or is it just about you and your friends and you enjoying your stuff? Do you, do you initiate conversations or you just wait for people to come to you? You know, do you ever have that urge? You sit down and you're like, man, nobody's friendly around here today. I'm just going to sit here and see if anybody talks to me. Now, that can be a whole group of people sitting around waiting for someone else to talk to them, talking about how unfriendly the place is when you're the person who might just be the unfriendly one. See, do we reflect the heart of God at church? How about this? Do you get excited when somebody sits in your seat? Because I know some of you, I was teasing them last night when I was doing sound check uh, about some people, you know, as soon as the doors open, a half an hour before, there are people who are coming in and sitting in their seats. And I was like, you guys have serious OCD issues, don't you? 
I'm going to pray for you. So we just had a little prayer meeting. Oh, the, uh, but, the, but the thing is, some of you get here really early so you can get your seat. Well, one day when you're a little bit late and you know, somebody holds you up because they want to be kind and talk to you in the foyer or whatever, and somebody's sitting in your seat, do you rejoice in that or do you grieve in that? See, because I'm praying that somebody will sit in your seat. <laughs> I just want you to know that. Sorry if that irritates you, but, but here's the thing. I'm praying that we have so many new people that come into the church, so many people that, that are seeking God, that you don't have your seat to sit in, and that you, when you see that, you'll go, thank you, God. I'm going to go sit someplace else. That, that's, that's the heart of God, and is, are you reflecting the heart of God at church? And, and by the way, I'm praising God that we're getting crowded. I know we're not uh, overcrowded at 8 o'clock yet, but we're working on it. You know, and, and uh, I just want you to know that that uh, we're making plans for future growth. You're going to hear us talking about it, but we're looking at adding services back over at the McCulloch campuses because our other services are filling up. And it may be a little different style uh, music, uh, video preaching most of the time. It's close enough, doesn't have to be all the time. But you're going to hear more about that because that's future, that's down the road. Uh, and uh, in two weeks, we've got Easter. And, and here's my challenge to you for, for Easter. I, I look around, and, and we're comfortably, you know, half-filled uh, in here at 8 o'clock. I'm just going to challenge you guys. Let's invite enough of our neighbors to fill this place up so that you guys are all sitting in the wrong seat in two weeks. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm serious about that. You know, we can go, oh, yeah, that's, that's great and everything. But here's the thing. We've got the invite cards. We made more because we ran out last week. We've got invite cards for you to, to take and invite people to both the Passion Experience and Easter. What about the next two weeks? We just pack this place out at 8 o'clock. We can do that. And, and here's the thing. You go, well, you know, I don't know. Okay, people who are far from God are not going to wake up next Sunday morning and go, I should go to church at 8 o'clock. They're just not going to do that. It's not on their agenda. It's not on their radar. Uh, but here's the reality. The statistics say that as many as 80% of your unchurched friends would actually come to church if someone invited them and went with them. That, that's a high percentage, which means, honestly, you know what it means? It means that most of the people who are going to church in America aren't inviting their unchurched friends. That's what it means. So uh, here's my challenge. Eight o'clock, we've got empty seats. Let's fill them up. Amen. Let's overflow this place. Let's start figuring out where we're going to put the overflow crowd for eight o'clock as well as for 930. That's, that's the challenge because that's honoring to God uh, in, in just the, the whole scheme of things because his heart is for people. So do you reflect the heart of God in your home? Do you reflect the heart of God at church? And do you reflect the heart of God in the community? In the community. Are you concerned about people who are far from God? Are you hoping that they repent? Or honestly, are you waiting to see them burn? And, and I ask that not, not really just to, uh, for you to think that's funny, but do you want to see people come to church, meet Jesus Christ, who look differently than you? who live differently than you, who vote differently than you? Do, you? do you want to see them repent, not of their politics or of their preferences, but of their sins and meet the Savior, Jesus Christ, and have their lives completely changed? Because that's the heart of God. We know that's the heart of Jesus. He already told us that. It's not the righteous, you know, that he came to save. It's the sinners. It's not the, the people who are healthy that he came to heal. It's the sick. So at Calvary, Calvary, we're trying to reflect the heart of God to Lake Havasu by serving our community. It's why we do the stuff we do. And we want people to know that God loves them. And, and we want them to know that there's hope for them. And we, and by the way, folks, this is our community, so we want to make our community better for us as well. And if we make it better for us, we'll make it better for everyone. And, and we want people to experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And we've kind of got that plastered on our wall out there as our mission statement. But do you know how we want them to experience that love of Jesus Christ? Through the love of his people and the power of his truth. Through the love of his people and the power of his truth, which means we have to actually reflect the heart of God to our community or else they're not going to know the love of his people. They're really not. So 
That means we need you to serve. We need you to volunteer. We need you to be a, a part of this. I, I don't want you to neglect your family in doing that, but I want you to say, hey, how can I use my gifts, my talents, my passions, my abilities to influence this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ? It may mean picking up a paintbrush. It may mean volunteering to help out, to tutor kids in reading. Uh, we've, we, yesterday we had uh, the Crossroads Car Show with over 320 cars, vehicles. Yeah, you guys worked great whole bunch of you volunteered and helped and made that a tremendous community outreach. Gave away over 1,200 hot dogs. Yep. How many did you eat, Chet? <laughs> Wait, you don't have to share that out loud. Sorry. The, uh, I realize Claudia is sitting there and that answer may not be completely, you know, you know, correct. So, but, you know, but thank you because you guys served and you made it a, a great event for the community and, and thousands of people came and were part of that. And, and that's an opportunity to touch people who are far from God. We've got teacher appreciation coming up in just a few weeks. We've got mission trips uh, starting in May that are going through October. And by the way, I, I need a few more people to go to Kenya with me in October. So if you want to go and take care of kids and teach kids, then, uh, you know, message me. But, but we've got opportunities for you to serve. So if we're going to impact our community, reflect the heart of God to our community, we need to serve. And we also need to invite. I already told you we've got invite cards available. And so if you didn't get some last week and, or you got some and you gave them all out and you want to get some more, then stop by the Connection Centers and grab some invite cards and put them in people's hands that don't go to church someplace else. This is the key. Invite your unchurched friends to church. We're so good at inviting our church friends to church. That's not right. It's not, okay, look, it, it, it may be great for you and your friends, but it's not missional. It's not part of the heart of God. So invite. Uh, so who are you bringing the next two weekends? And then we need to serve, we need to invite, and we need to reflect God's heart every day. We need to reflect the heart of God in our community, and, and that means that we need to be patient and kind in traffic, in the restaurants toward the servers, in the grocery stores, in the doctor's offices, even at children's ball games, we need to be patient and kind. Because when we reflect the heart of God at home and at church and community, his joy flows into our lives and we rejoice when God rejoices. If you're really wondering why there isn't the joy in your life, if you're really wondering why the, that peace isn't there and that satisfaction isn't there, Maybe it goes back to our heart. Jonah didn't share the heart of God. That was his problem. What about you? Because it's your choice. Let's pray.